I discovered I had epilepsy. I was 18. I was at school. That was about 1976. Um, around the time when I was doing my A-levels, so it was quite stressful. Because it's a very unpredictable type of uh, thing to have. It made me feel quite uncertain most of the time. I was born in the 50s, so my childhood was in the 50s and 60s when things were quite different, really, compared to how they are now. And the focus was very much on assimilation, so we were meant to be as English as possible. But it was quite challenging in terms of being very English outside and adapting to all that, but being very Indian within home because my mother would hang on quite tightly to her Indianness and to her, you know, to her Hinduism within the house. At school, I was very aware of having to make up a bit of a fantasy home life, really, about how I lived my life. So I remember, I was always an avid reader of sort of Janet and John type books and I made up this real fantasy life you know, about just, you know, at the weekend, you know, me and my mum and my dad and our dog would go out to the seaside and all rubbish like that, which is completely untrue, you know. And then as I grew up, as I sort of got into teenagehood, I became a bit more aware that actually I was quite different from the rest of them. I suppose I just tried to shut my mind to it as much as possible. My friends were all going to parties and things and, uh, you know, I got invited as part of the group. But of course, that wasn't part of what was expected of me as an Indian, you know, a teenager. I started to hear a voice that was um, commenting on what I was doing. It was saying things about the people that were close to me, warning me about them. If I'm feeling bad about myself, the voice will criticise me, will talk about me in a, in a very critical way, often homing in on the, the weaknesses I'm most worried about. Then I went off to university and I just couldn't handle it. I just couldn't cope with being in such a strange environment. It just felt so difficult to actually communicate with anybody and I actually became quite fearful of people so that I wouldn't even leave my room. I eventually ended up taking over dose. And that was like my first admission into psychiatric hospital. And so I had that admission and then I sort of, you know, came out, struggled on for a bit, went, took another drive dose, went back in, you know, and then the next few years seemed to be a bit like that, just kind of spending quite long periods of time within psychiatric hospital. The voices I hear, from my understanding, are um, part of me. They're probably thoughts and feelings that I've got that maybe I'm not aware of, that they're in the unconscious mind. Maybe that my conscious side isn't ready or able to take some of those issues on. For example, I think Sometimes when I felt paranoid about other people, that may be that unconsciously I feel angry with those people, but actually find that a difficult feeling to have or to accept. I 
do know that a lot of my stuff is around kind of feeling quite guilty. If I look back, it sometimes seems like things happen almost without me realising, so that I'll sort of have some success. And then it's kind of like I'll kind of turn some sorts and cartwheels trying to avoid kind of owning that. There's just something about being successful that kind of doesn't feel right and it doesn't feel like anything to do with me. Always this big fear that you're going to be sussed out, somebody is going to see through you. I don't know, maybe a lot of success is very fragile. I've gone away from management, which is what I was in um, when I had my first episode. I, th I think I know that managing services doesn't suit me. I don't think I need work to feel well as such, but I think it shows me that other people believe in me. I'd always felt, as an Indian woman who hadn't got married, that I hadn't quite fulfilled my role in life, that I hadn't had kids. So I had to make another role for myself in life. So actually, science suited me quite well. Perfect job for a, for a psychiatric patient, being a research worker, because Every time I went into hospital, my research grant just got suspended. And then when I was in a position to go back to work, my boss would start my research grant up again. To all intents and purposes, being quite a successful researcher. But what was so strange was that I was still taking me with me wherever I went. So I'd go to the conferences, I'd do my talk and that would be fine. But every coffee time or every lunch time, I would just go and sit in the toilet, you know, literally behind a locked door, because I couldn't cope with kind of being with, with people. This last year, um, year 2002, was uh, probably one of the most difficult years I've ever had. My Mother um, did pass on in the September, so it was a very painful year. I think what helped, friendships, friends were fantastic. I think getting close to my father and my sister through my mum's illness, but after it, um, I suppose I developed a way of being my own person a bit more. I think feeling it was OK to ask people to back off or give me a bit of space. By knowing myself better, by knowing what I felt about things and accepting that, I think made my boundaries more solid. My partner, Paul, was very, very supportive. I feel very lucky. I've been with Paul for 26 years um, and we've been through a lot in those years. In terms of kind of relationships, I think for a lot of my life or for a long time it's very much been about being acceptable to the other person, being what they want you to be. So as long as I could do that, then it felt okay. There's still a bit of me inside that kind of feels quite strongly that actually I shouldn't have those positive relationships or that still doesn't feel quite comfortable with them. And I think I am very aware that a lot of the stuff that's going on inside me is around kind of me being this quite destructive person who needs to be punished. 
keeping it easy, trying to de-stress. Now I'm allowing myself to actually have friends in a very honest way. It kind of challenges all that stuff. And that's really hard, because I can't rely on that anymore. I can't just blanket say, no, I'm this shit person that nobody wants to have anything to do with because the friends I've got now. I have to believe what they're saying to me about me. Take a moment. <laughs> I'm making a meal of it, mate. <laughs> so can we assume yes? Yes, I assume yes. I had therapy for um, 10 years, um, very formal psychoanalytical psychotherapy. At first it was difficult to engage with the therapy and even after the second admission that was still difficult. In later years in that therapy it was very helpful to try and understand um, what had led to those, those breakdowns really. What had led to them and what I needed to do differently and actually making each time I'd had a breakdown a useful experience that I could learn from. Partly to prevent, you know, more episodes, but mainly to use that time as a way of understanding myself uh, on a deeper level. That space allowed me to explore some of the things that had led to me having psychotic episodes and some of the issues that were going on for me. So I learnt that it's okay and in fact quite good to feel feelings and express them. I think I've learnt to be more comfortable with my feelings, to be more comfortable with me, which has then allowed me to be more comfortable with other people and their feelings. circumstances happened that made me start thinking about, hang on a minute, what's this about? You know, why, why do I get depressed for no reason? Why do I feel so much that I just want to die, I just want to escape? Why does that seem so sensible? I started thinking a bit more about maybe there were circumstances and there were reasons why I was the way I was. I wasn't able to see that actually quite a lot of my life I've lived in very black and white terms. And so, like, in terms of my Indianness and my Englishness, has always been very separate. I am trying to work on bringing bits of myself together. Bring some of the distresses or experiences I've been through into my life as a whole really, into the well part of my life and I suppose part of that has been kind of being involved with the mental health service user movement. It has allowed me to to be honest about some of the stuff I've been through, to dare to look at some of those experiences and to realise I'm not the only one who goes through that stuff. The writing has been useful in lots of ways. Writing's been useful to get things out of my head. It's been useful in terms of um, me being able to go back to look at some of that stuff. And because I had such a problem actually just talking, using my writing was a very effective way of kind of enabling me to look at some issues. It does feel like I've been in this dark forest, quite a lot of chaos and quite a lot of demons around and quite a lot of scary stuff around. But I feel as well that within that forest there was also kind of like a little cloud around me that protected me.
I'm a bit of my journey is is going uphill a bit now and sort of clawing my way along a bit by my fingertips. That feels okay to, to be at that place actually at the moment because it feels like I'm moving. My relationship with my voices is still quite difficult. Sometimes I do listen to them uh, when I've got time and space to do that. That's the beginning of probably being able to make appointments with them, which some other people can do. I used to believe everything the voices say, and I don't so much now. I just try and think, well, if Paul told me those things, would I believe them? So it's trying to think of it in that way. I've got a hope or a dream that my relationship with the voices that I hear will improve and that I'll at least be an equal partner. Unknown, yet tantalising, mesmerising, drawing me into a strange and different world, scaringly thrilling as I venture trance-like onto the strange helter-skelter of life once more.